Hi, Misha here, and I'm back to do another video on Japanese armor, looking at another Imperial Japanese Army tank from World War II. We already talked about the Type 95, which was a light tank and the most produced tank that Japan had, with about 2300 built. Now we're going to talk about the Type 97 Chiha which was a medium tank and the second most produced if you count both variants here around 2100 in the front we have the original they built about 1160 and behind it we have the uh, Kai version the improved version with the different better gun and they would build about 930 of those during the war this model is from dragon and this model is quite interesting it's from precise or precision a company probably no one's heard of because these models were never really sold i'll explain more about that when we get to it but first let's check out the original chiha Japanese Type 97 light tank, oh, excuse me, medium tank. Good times. All right, on to the spinny thing. The Type 95 light tank was partially there to replace the older Type 89, but mostly there for the cavalry and to replace their Type 92 armored car, quote unquote. The infantry accepted the 95 because it was better than what they had but what they really needed was a true replacement for the Type 89, specifically the Type 89B. So really right after the Type 95 was solidified, they started working in 1935-1936 on a new design, primarily at Mitsubishi. And the first prototype would be built in 1936, and it was essentially a scaled up Type 95. It used the bell crank suspension system, but went from four to six road wheels. They went to a thicker, heavier armor. They upgraded the engine, still a diesel, to keep a reasonable top speed. It went from a three-man to a four-man crew with two in the turret. And it used the same 57 millimeter, relatively low velocity main gun as the Type 89. Initially, they wanted to use a new higher velocity gun, which was uh, going to be the 47 millimeter, but um, it wasn't ready yet, so kind of had to wait. They did make a few minor improvements to the Type 89's 57 millimeter gun, calling it the Type 97 tank gun. And like the Type 95, this was designed primarily to support Japanese infantry and fight enemy infantry. It wasn't really designed as a tank killer. And at first, it wasn't even sure if the Mitsubishi design would succeed. Another company, Osaka, offered another Type 97 that was a little bit lighter and cheaper. And for a time, they debated which one to go with, but in July of 1937, with the Second Sino-Japanese War officially fully underway, invasion of Manchuria and all that happening, the, the military was given, the army was given the budget, so they went with the better Mitsubishi design, putting it in production by 1938. And whereas they only built 31 Type 95s in its first year, they actually built 110 Type 97s. And there would be two principal factories building these with a couple of secondary factories and, of course, plenty of uh, subcontractors. So, uh, yeah, what do we have here? So what do we have here? Well, like I said, it has a 57mm main gun, still relatively low velocity, still a relatively light gun. It's in a standard turret. Interestingly, it's a little bit in a swiveling, swiveling or movable mount where the gunner can, again, use his shoulder to either stabilize it or make minor 
corrections to fire it. It's relatively light. At least now we have the commander gunner and now he's joined by a loader. They can also operate the Type 97 machine gun in the back. 7.7 millimeter. And we have a second Type 97 in the front next to the driver that has its own crewman to, uh, to do that. This is a much heavier tank. It's about 14 and a half tons. And it has armor ranging from 8 millimeters at the thinnest up to 25 millimeters, so about an inch at its thickest. So about twice the armor of the 95. This version here does have an antenna around the turret for a radio. While that wasn't a standard feature for the Type 97, it was a much more common feature than on the 95. It had a max top speed of just under 40 kilometers per hour, about 38, 39, so a little slower than the Type 95. But the whole idea behind this, the whole, well, one of the problems with the Type 89 is it was too slow to keep up with modern vehicles, so it had to have a reasonable top speed. Since it does use the bell crank suspension, like the 95, the ride is a little on the rough side. <laughs> but these would be mass produced, primarily between 1939 and 1941. And as I said, they built about 1160 plus a couple of pre-production and prototypes and what have you. But then it would be replaced by the, uh, the other model we have here, the Type 97 Ki. The difference between the original Type 97 and the Type 97 Ki is the turret and the main gun, at least primarily. Now this model is from Precise, and it's a really interesting story. First off, I will say this one was not pre-assembled. I've been putting it together. There are still some antenna and things I need to have a friend help me glue on. So it looks like it's missing some parts. Yeah. These were actually pre, I don't know, uh, samples that were done years ago by a, an Asian company, a Chinese company, a series of eight or nine tanks and they were not ever put in commercial packaging. They were actually in little kind of air-filled bags, like, kind of like a toy you'd find in a uh, cereal box. Just little cheap things that were there for fun that never took off. But much like with the Japanese aircraft, you can't really find many Japanese tanks. The Dragons made a few, but this series that never, never was actually has done some interesting ones, even though they're maybe not the best quality ever. They're good little example pieces and very inexpensive. Anywho, the genesis of the Kahi dates back to 1939 when the first four Type 97s were sent to fight the Russians at Kalkingal. Now, I will say that some of the earliest production models were sent to China in 1938, and they did well because... Uh, well, they weren't fighting armor. In 1939, they got to tangle with the Russian tanks. In fact, one of the Type 97s with the 57 millimeter gun was selected to be the commander's tank there. And not only was it destroyed, it actually caught fire, blew up, and killed all but one of the crew. Not a great start, not gonna lie. And one of the analysis of the battle afterwards was that neither the 37mm or the 57mm gun did especially well because they were relatively low velocity. They were designed to fight infantry or, or light unarmored vehicles, not other tanks. So the idea of having a higher velocity anti-tank 47mm gun was brought back up. And in 1941, the Type 1 gun was first created and tested. In the interim, Type 97 production with the 57 millimeter gun was underway, and these were used first in relatively small numbers, 
against the British, mainly in Malaya and Singapore. And then they would soon be used against the Americans too, but the Americans at this time were mostly encountering the 95. But production would continue to ramp up for the 97. And one thing that was kind of neat about it, even though it was a medium tank, it was still pretty light, and therefore it was actually able to traverse swampy, jungly, nasty, muddy, mucky terrain that the British had just automatically assumed was not passable by any kind of heavy armor. So the Japanese were actually pretty successful in coming from directions the British could not anticipate and took them by surprise more than once in late 1941 and 1942. And again, it was going up against kind of older and second-line British tanks, so it wasn't such a big deal. But they knew that it really needed that better gun. So, in 1942, the Kahi would replace the original tank on the production lines. Essentially, the hull is unchanged. The difference is the new turret. We go from a two-man turret to a three. So now we have a loader, a gunner, and a commander. And of course, one of those can switch off to operate the rear-facing machine gun, too. So this definitely assisted things quite a bit. And they also had a newer radio for the tanks that were given radios. The 47mm gun had a longer barrel for higher velocity, so even though the diameter was less, it actually had much better penetration. It was one of the first Japanese tank guns designed to actually punch through armor. Of course, it was designed to punch through Russian tank armor from the 1930s and wouldn't be all that competitive with American armor on the Sherman for very long, but that's neither here nor there. 1942 would be the highest production year for the Type 97. <clears throat> they would only build about 30 of the original 57 millimeter gun tanks, but they would take 300 hulls intended to be that and turn them into the Kahi variant and they would produce over 500 of those in that year and considering that they only built about 930 Kahis that means that over half were produced in this first year. In fact most sources say that production was over by 1943. As we talked about in the Type 95 video even if they continued to make these in 1944, 1945. Tank production was exceedingly low in Japan in those years, fewer than 1,044 and just over 250 in 1945. And by that point, they had other tanks that they were building, so yeah. Nevertheless, <clears throat> both together, they had about 2,100, and it was a respectable medium tank. Again, kind of able to traverse nasty environments in the Pacific. So in 1942, it was certainly better than the 95. And uh, it really would become the backbone. I guess you could call it the best tank that was actually produced in any kind of numbers. Japan would have better tanks like the Type 3 or the Type 5, but those are not really, yeah, story for another day. So with that, let's talk about the service of both of these, because just because the 57 millimeter version was out of production, obviously they had quite a large number of them, more than the Kahi variant, so both would serve throughout the Pacific. After some pretty decent early successes, the Type 97, alongside the Type 95, was used against the, the British and her allies in Burma, and it would soon come up against American forces. In fact, one of the largest Japanese groupings of tanks and tank battles would happen on June 16th through the 17th during the Marines' landings at Saipan. They would have quite a large number, 44 of them there, large for Japanese, and they would 
first meet the M4 Sherman. And it wouldn't be long before the Kahi would go into service and, and see combat against the Sher Sherman. They found that the 47 millimeter gun could not penetrate the Sherman's front armor, but if it got a side shot on, it had a chance of going through. At least, good news for the Japanese, it was able to take on and be generally superior to the M3 Stuart, the Type 95's old rival. So they would appear on Guam and other campaigns throughout the war. And they would continue to deploy them throughout 1943 and 44. And they would have about 14 there to greet the Allies at Okinawa in April of 1945, along with 13 Type 95s. So, you know, doesn't sound horrible, 27 tanks, until you realize that they were facing 800 U.S. tanks, many of the latest M4 types and otherwise. So you can imagine how well that went. As with the 95, by this point, the ones that survived were either in the home islands being prepped to defend against the expected Allied invasion. They were used in kamikaze-style charges or bonsai-style charges, if you prefer. Or they were made into pillboxes. At least with the 47 millimeter gun, it had a chance of penetrating armor. Really, the last engagement for the Type 97 would come in August of 1945, much like with the Type 95. These would be deployed to counter the Russian invasion of Manchuria, but again, as with the 95, they really didn't see a whole lot of combat. They were mostly surrendered or abandoned or otherwise. In fact, Russia captured nearly 400 Japanese tanks there, and that would, uh, would pretty much be the end of things. I, honestly, if the Type 97 had had the 47 millimeter gun from the beginning, it would have been much better. Kind of like how a lot of British tanks should have had the 6-pounder instead of the 2-pounder. But at the end of the war, it was still outclassed by other guns and the increasingly heavy armor on Allied tanks. But its service would continue a little bit after the war, but not in Japan. During the late 40s and into the early 50s, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the Communists, would actually redeploy both the Type 95 and Type 97. Some were tanks they captured themselves. Others were originally captured by Russia and then passed along to their, at that time, Chinese allies. Of course, as China would acquire newer and better tanks, they would uh, kind of get away from that. But that would be the last use of the 97, just kind of secondhand throughout Asia. They had a decent number, but yeah, a lot were lost in the war. And it wasn't a horrible tank for its day and time, it had a good range. It had a diesel engine. It was re it was actually quite fast for what it was. Still quite light, able to traverse a lot of terrain that others would could not or would not. <laughs> a four and then later five man crew, two machine guns. Really, where it was kind of lagging behind, the armor was still very light, even though it was double that of the ninety five, and the main gun. Even they knew that, the, the, except, accepting the 57 millimeter at the beginning was uh, always a compromise. But next to the 95, the most common Japanese tank. This uh, Dragon model, the turret does move. And actually, with this uh, precise model, the turret moves and the gun itself actually flexes in the mount a bit like it would have. These are kind of neat for what they are, little inexpensive cereal box models. I just wish you didn't have to put them together. I kind of wonder if these ever went into production, if they would have come pre-assembled like the Dragon, 
or if they were always intended to be put together. I don't know. You'll be seeing a few more from this company as I do these Japanese videos because frankly they're the only ones who ever made a lot of these models in the in the scale so I just thought I would uh, talk about them here today let me know what you think again not something we often think about Japanese armor in World War II I will say though when you look at the numbers the Allies were fielding late in the war and what the Japanese had it's I don't want to use the word sad but they just they weren't they weren't prepared to fight the industrial might of the US or for that matter even really the UK and they they knew that yeah, but once they got into the war pride and hubris played a role Alrighty, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. If you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon. Thanks.